Hello, Dr. Jason Saunders with HBOT USA. Uh, I wanted to make another video again. This is in direct response to uh, Dr. Cameron Kyle Seidel's last video. I just really want to keep this conversation moving and open. I want people who actually have the ability to influence uh, care and policy to hear more information. Uh, you know, it's not easy for all of us to get in a room and talk to each other, but if we can put out content and that content makes sense and the people who actually have the ability to make these decisions can hear some of this information and do something about it, we can make a difference. And so in his last video, uh, Dr. Cameron Kyle Seidel mentions uh, that yes, there might be some ventilation perfusion issues. In other words, how we're breathing and how well oxygen's getting in. There, there might be issues there, but that, that does not account for the full story. Uh, yes, there might be some pulmonary shunting going on, but again, that does not account for the full story. What they're seeing, especially for the pulmonary shunt, uh, those folks don't usually respond well to oxygen. And it does appear that in these hospitals that patients put on oxygen therapy, even if it's just high flow oxygen, they can maintain close to normal saturation levels. If they pull that oxygen, their saturation drops again. And so I want to put out a video about uh, oxygen diffusion, because one of his theories is that maybe there's some type of diffusion error occurring. Now, one of the other articles, or actually a few articles I've read recently, are also talking about the potential that the virus is actually attacking, you know, some part of the hemoglobin molecule, possibly the beta chain of the hemoglobin, which, you know, that wouldn't necessarily affect the diffusion into the circulatory system, but it certainly would affect the red blood cells ability to uh, hold the oxygen and carry the oxygen uh, to our cells. And so it would decrease oxygen saturation. So again, you know, information is coming out every day. We're just trying to make sense of it. We're trying to put out information that helps people help patients. And so I wanna to talk today about the process of diffusion so that we could understand that a little bit differently and maybe uh, where some of these other oxygen therapies may fit uh, the broader scope of, of helping these patients. And so um, on my screen here, you should be able to see uh, that we're talking about, here's a alveola um, and, and uh, a capillary, you know, in, in the lung tissue. And so basically we're trying to get rid of carbon dioxide and we're trying to bring in oxygen. And so when we breathe in, there's a pressure gradient that allows this oxygen, uh, the pressure of the oxygen in, in our lung tissue is higher than the pressure of oxygen in our capillary system. And as a result, oxygen moves from high concentration to low concentration. Likewise, the concentration of carbon dioxide in our uh, circulatory system is higher than the concentration of ox or carbon dioxide in our lung tissue. And as a result, as it passes the alveola, uh, carbon dioxide moves from high concentration inside our body to low concentration into our lung, and we can exhale that. So in reality, you know, we basically, we all live in this atmosphere and depending on where you live, there is a pressure. And that pressure is uh, either 14.7 PSI or 760 millimeters of mercury. And so um, that's, a, that's a force that's working down on our body at all times. We don't feel it because it's surrounding us and it doesn't change. This is at sea level, by the way. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's a, that's a pressure of air that's working on our body. And that pressure of air creates a gradient that allows oxygen to be moving again from high concentration to low concentration. So the pressure, uh, air is 21% oxygen. So 760 times 0.21, which is 21% oxygen yields about 159 or 160 millimeters of mercury, um, of oxygen, you know, in the, at sea level in our air. And so that is a pressure, uh, a PO2, it's a pressure of oxygen. And that PO2, once it gets into our lungs, becomes about 104 or 103 millimeters of mercury. And so at 104 millimeters of mercury of pressure and the oxygen or the, the blood coming through our circulation is at about 45 millimeters of mercury. And so deoxygenated blood uh, is about 45 millimeters of mercury as it comes to our lung tissue. And oxygen levels in our alveola are about 104. And so that is the pressure gradient that allows this diffusion to occur. And so if we're having diffusion issues, uh, we need to look deeper to figure out what that is. However, this is the exact amount of uh, 
uh, pressure, 104 millimeters of mercury that, at sea level, that is allowing our red blood cells to absorb oxygen as they're floating through. And so our red blood cells have hemoglobin. Hemoglobin each have four spots for oxygen to bind to. And so what's interesting, most people don't realize this, uh, hemoglobin uh, typically has four binding sites. And really as blood circulates, uh, deoxygenated blood is what we call it, but deoxygenated blood still has 75% of the oxygen um, still bound to it. So we only typically deliver about 25% of the oxygen from our red blood cells to our tissues before it goes back to our lungs to get reoxygenated. So it's still holding on typically to a lot of the oxygen. It's only one binding site that it drops off and, and picks up. And so um, when this diffusion occurs, and this is really where, where this gets important, where this diffusion occurs, we're getting this oxygen to come across into the um, into the circulatory system. And as these red blood cells are moving through in this direction, they're picking up the oxygen and moving through. Now, the diffusion doesn't go from alveola to red blood cell. It goes from the alveola to the circulatory system in the blood, so into the liquid of the blood, but it immediately binds to hemoglobin as it travels through. And so there's basically just enough time for every red blood cell to pick up that one binding site of oxygen and move through circulation back to the tissue. So my point here is this, if we can improve the amount of, blood, of oxygen that's diffusing across this line to basically create a reservoir of uh, extra oxygen, that extra oxygen is now dissolved into the plasma and we're bypassing. So whether it's a red blood cell that's getting uh, attacked or the hemoglobin that's being destroyed by the virus, or there is some barrier that's, that's decreasing the ability of some of that diffusion to occur. If we can increase the diffusion of oxygen across this line and get a higher amount of oxygen to deliver uh, into the blood, to be dissolved into the blood, to bypass the red blood cell, to bypass the hemoglobin system altogether, that we could use to actually help increase oxygenation levels, not O2 saturation, but actually increased oxygen deliverable to the tissues because that oxygen is now dissolved in the plasma portion of the blood. And as we use that reservoir as a, as a, as a uh, storage for this increased oxygen, we could deliver much higher levels of oxygen to the tissue. Is this gonna cure the virus? No, but is this going to increase the issue, the, you know, at least temporarily solve the problem of decreased oxygen to the tissue? And that's really what we're trying to get to here. All this is gonna do is this is gonna buy patients time for their body to continue to fight the infection but it allows the oxygenation of the tissue to remain higher while they're fighting that infection. And so what we could do is instead of 159 millimeters of mercury, which is the typical pressure of oxygen in the air, we can increase those numbers. And so using hyperbaric oxygen, which is basically taking this pressure that's working all around our body all the time, instead of, you know, 14.7 PSI, we could, we could make that an extra, 10 PSI, 5 PSI, an extra 15 PSI, an extra 20 PSI. We can increase this number of pressure that's working around our body. And as we increase the pressure of the air around us, we increase the pressure of the air in our lungs. And as we increase the pressure of the air in our lungs, we increase the gradient because the, the 45 millimeters of mercury that's coming back as deoxygenated blood, that's a constant. That's not gonna change that much. And so, but if we can increase the, the strength of the gradient between the pressure in our lungs and the pressure of the deoxygenated blood, the larger the gradient, the faster, more efficient, and just more gas will move from one end to the other. And so as we raise the pressure, we raise the pressure in the environment, we raise the pressure in our lungs, we raise the amount of oxygen being diffused into the capillary system. And under pressure, as long as we keep that person under pressure for some period of time, that oxygen remains diffused into the plasma of the blood, which means it's free floating. It's not bound to hemoglobin. It's free floating oxygen going all over the body, attaching to anything that it needs to attach to. So, uh, and feed the system uh, the oxygen that it needs. Now, when you come out of the chamber, that oxygen starts to leave the capillary system. And that's okay too, because as it's leaving the capillary system, it's still interacting with those tissues. 
And so if we were doing potentially at least one session a day of 60 to 90 minutes, maybe two sessions a day, you know, a morning and an afternoon session, we're not going to be anywhere near oxygen toxicity level. So we don't have to worry about the consequences of high oxygen. So we will have no oxygen toxicity issues. And at the same time, we'll be able to hyper oxygenate these people for chunks throughout the day, keeping their tissue saturation at higher levels, even if their uh, oxygen saturation of red blood cells tends to fall off. I hope this helps. And uh, thanks a lot for your attention.